Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Hello, guys. Welcome back to Construct Your Life. Construct your life, construct my life, construct everybody's life. We have the honor of having my good. Look at this guy over here. Look at this guy, Mr. Childs. How are you doing, sir? Doing great, man. Thanks for inviting me on the podcast. No, it's a pleasure, guys. Uh, this gentleman holds a special place in my heart because he's working on my stuff, uh, my website, my digital marketing. So lots of stuff to talk about. He is a entrepreneur. He is in the Airbnb space. He is in the building of business space. He's in so many things. Very talented human being. Guys, before we get started, I want to thank dreamchasers.com for uh, hosting and supporting and sponsoring the website. Thank you, Adam Carswell. But uh, Mr. Childs Cree, before we get started, I'd like my guests to talk, tell their story where they want to and we'll kind of go from there, buddy. So why don't you tell everybody who you are and we'll kind of go from there. Cool, man. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me on the podcast. It's funny because I never thought that I would be invited on your podcast by just messaging you about hearing you on a podcast, which is crazy, right? So it's yeah. it's, it's really funny. Um, I also, I started my business about three years ago and got so focused on doing the work that I completely missed the mark on networking. And mm. like you taught me something really important with networking. Um, uh, if I had known about all the stuff that you share on your podcast, just for free with everybody, mm -hmm. uh, back when I first started out in business almost seven years ago, who knows where we'd be. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that's kind of the point of this podcast is just to, uh, continuously learn and develop and grow. So my story started out back when I came out of the womb. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it, <laughs> I won't go back that far. I went to college, like most, you know, good students. My parents kind of bred me to be a college graduate and I played lacrosse and I was, I had to go get a uh, education full ride at my university in order to be able to afford college or so I thought, right. That was like my, my next step. So I went off to school. I got a good degree. I got an engineering and business degree. Uh, my first semester though, I realized I didn't want to be in engineering. I wanted to be in business. I want to be, I want to be the guy that owned the business, not the person that showed up and punched the clock every day. And I kind of grappled with that for a long time was I had this, this notion in my mind that I will not get a job where I have to sit in a cubicle. And it's funny because this is basically a cube. This is like a rectangle. But it's <laughs> so, your cube, but it's your cube. But it's my cube, right? No, it's actually, I rent this cube and we're about to do some arbitrage with it. But the, the point of the story was that I went off to college because that's what my parents told me I needed to do. And I had a lot of valuable experiences, but for a long time, I was holding those inside. I was like being resentful about that experience. And fast forward to a bunch of failed starts, a couple failed businesses. Uh, my first successful business was doing marketing for other people because I had all this head knowledge that I hadn't actually applied uh, very realistically. I was selling online since 2009, uh, eBay, Amazon, just flipping stuff. I drive around, I'd find stuff that was junk and literally sell it for hundreds of dollars. Uh, and I just kind of parlayed that to pay off all my student loans. And then once I was at a student loan debt, I was like, I got to be using my time better. So I started to get uh, educated on marketing. I went to go get certified at Keep, Infusionsoft, marketing automation. Uh, and I'm, I'm a systems guy. So like we have systems for everything. I've got a system for the toilet seat. I've got a system for, you know, cleaning the bathroom. I've got a system for, you know, I've got a, a system for doing the dishes. So like the dishes are never in the sink or in the dishwasher for more than a day, right? We've got a, <laughs> my wife and I have a system for everything. Oh, so, God. God bless your wife. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know how she puts up with me, but that, that directly lends it to what we're doing now, which is the short-term rentals and, you know, doing uh, lease arbitrage and doing um, property management remote and whatnot. And uh, same thing with marketing is that my, my strong suit's not being a sales commando. It's not going out and pounded doors. Uh, I tried that. I, I really sucked at that. My first job, out of college, I was making a thousand bucks a month, living on my dad's couch, driving his car, eating his groceries, not paying for anything at all. 
and I was still getting further into debt, I'm not a sales commando. Like I'm not, I'm not the guy that'll go out and bang a thousand doors out in a day. But at the same time, like I'm the guy that could talk to a thousand people at once using a system. Mm -hmm. And then of those thousand people, you get to talk to 35 people that are ready to buy. It's interesting. People that would see me in the wild, as they call it, they would see me in networking, think that I want to be at the loud events with a thousand people. And don't get me wrong. I can hold my own in those events, but I'm a, I'm a one-on-one guy. Like I like yeah. to have a conversation, but there are aspects, you know, something that you said to me that, that, you know, to give you, you, you've inspired me and you changed the way I thought about my business and you've been helping me do that. You said, Austin, you're a doer. Like, but at some point you have to like stop for a second and realize like what you're even doing. Right. And, and so like, I think there's an aspect to getting a business started and just getting out of the gates. And then the last three months, four months for me have been like, what are we actually doing? What does everything cost? How can we get everything tight? And so like, what has made you like, cause I think this is a lot of people's issues is like, maybe they're good at like the, the work, but they're not good at the networking part. Like, mm-hmm. What are the aspects of you that you realize that that are a strength for you, even though you may not be the most networking dude? How have you combated that against like still meeting entrepreneurs and, and, and networking? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll do my best to answer it. Um, I am a networker. I, I'm a I, I'm a born salesman, right? A born mm-hmm. salesman. I just love talking to people and I love talking, but I also have learned to love to listen because mm-hmm. One of the things that gives most people anxiety, and I get anxiety just like everybody else whenever I'm trying to sell something, trying to convey an idea, is selling to the wrong people, right? Mm-hmm. So if I was, for instance, I was trying to sell you know, gym memberships at Globo Gym where I could get my steroids on and you know, drink my protein jugs, I, would, I wouldn't sell it to an 85-year-old woman, right? Mm-hmm. If I'm trying to sell it to my grandma who is going through dialysis, who can, she's, I'm glad she's on a treadmill. I'm glad that she's on a bicycle, right? <laughs> If I try and pitch her, I'm going to be like really, really frustrated. If nothing else, she's going to be like, huh, what, huh, what? Like she can't hear me, let alone she, it's just not the right product for her. So I think that there's, when you go to a networking event, my, my first client, I'll give you an example. My first digital marketing client, when I quit my job three and a half years ago, I walked into a room and said, I do digital marketing. Mm-hmm. And then some, one person of the 30 people came up to me and was like, what's wrong with my website? And I was like, I don't know. Let's, let's take a look. But what I did was I struck a nerve, right? If I had said something to the effect of, you know, I help real estate investors maximize their time and create leverage in their business so that they can have more free time to spend with their family. Someone's going to be like, what the heck are you doing? Or I'd like to learn more. It sounded kind of like a sales pitch, but I'm still curious. I still want to hear more, more so than just I do digital marketing. But the, the gentleman had a pain point, which was my website's broke. I paid money for it it's not making me money. Can you fix it? Mm -hmm. And the same thing too, with, um, with the advertising that he was doing, he was spending $8,000 a month on TV ads to generate 30 calls, usually of kind of aggravated, frustrated people that just want to get, get a price and then close maybe one deal every two months. So he was spending all of his money on marketing to get one deal in the pipeline to then close it, to hopefully have enough money the next month be able to pay for the bills that he already racked up. If that makes sense. So what I'm hearing from you is that quote about, was it George Washington or something like that? When you go to cut down a tree, you know, the young guy's sharpen the axe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're spending the first three hours sharpening the axe. Like you thrive off of efficiency in business yeah. and getting to the actual target. Correct. Yeah. And, and the, the problem with someone like me is that I'm an analyzer. And I'll be so analytical and I'll be breaking down, uh, trying to get every single efficiency when the engine hasn't even started yet. But then someone like you is just like, boom, 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 bang, 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 bang. Let's go get this thing set up. Let's go do this. And so you're spread out like 35 different ways. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's narrow it down to, Mm -hmm. hey, what's making you the most money for your time? Yeah. You know? And so So, like the the people, I I had a business partner uh, real quick and then I'll I'll switch back over. I had a business partner like you who is just like, shoot from the hip, run seven businesses mm-hmm. at once. Love the guy. He's exact opposite of me. He's like, let's just pull the trigger. 
And I'm like, I need to analyze it more. And he's like, pull the trigger. And I'm like, analyze. And so I learned that in business, I have to be around people that are opposite of me because mm -hmm. if not, then I'm never going to pull the trigger. I'm never going to get started. You know? Mm. So like that, that was one valuable lesson was I, I love learned it. it from banging my head against the wall. So my, my other podcast co-host, Anthony Bassano, who's a master's insight or podcast about philosophy. He said something like multiple times and you're going to, you're going to fucking love this shit. It's a theory called uh, shooting bullets and cannons. And what he says is if you were to shoot a cannon right away, you don't know where your target is. You're wasting the big ammo. But what the technique is, is shoot bullets first, get the trajectory, find out where your target is, then shoot the cannon. Yep. Yeah. Once you hear it out, then you shoot the cannon at him. <laughs> and it's exactly. It's, and yeah, it, it's funny. I was just going to say, it's funny that you say that because that was the exact experience we had with, with Amazon. You know, we started an Amazon business, my wife and I, I'm sure that if I mention Amazon, she'll still cringe <laughs> because it was like, I was working my job at Apple, 60 hour work weeks. I would come home. I would bring a bunch of crap in and like throw it on the floor and be like, Hey, let's go package this up and send it to Amazon. <laughs> And when I did the math, we were making like $7 an hour. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I might as well just go get a job at McDonald's. I'll make 10 bucks an hour. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, after expenses and everything, I'm not making any money in this business. So mm -hmm. it, there is something to be said about, you know, get it started. But then once you've got some revenue coming in, you've got to look at your expenses and just figure out, okay, where's the bloat? Because we were spending like 500 bucks a month on software and that was eating up all of our profits. Yeah. Well, ultimately, it's if you look at wholesale businesses, right? This is the stuff that it doesn't that baffles my mind. It's like, yeah, you might be making money, but you're spending sixty, ninety thousand dollars a month. And if there's any inefficiencies or anything happens, the market shifts. Mm -hmm. That machine's going to eat you alive. And so, my my question to most business owners, and I'd be interested to hear your theory on this because I know you love finance. I think the number one problem for businesses and entrepreneurs is they don't know their gross to net profit margins and how do they stretch those, correct? Yeah, and I would say even more so too. It's like, I kind of view it like the levels of college. So like at the base level, you've got like flipping and wholesaling, right? Well, actually I would say, it doesn't matter what you're, you're wholesaling, right? You can wholesale paper clips, you can wholesale houses, mm -hmm. you can wholesale businesses, right? You're just bundling them together and selling them in volume. You can wholesale phones, but then at some point when you're kind of tired of the 5% profit margins, then you kind of want to move up to something like flipping. But the problem with flipping is how do you scale? So like when I was doing Amazon arbitrage, I was making more money in my eBay business than I was mm -hmm. selling stuff on Amazon. Cause I go out to these garage sales and I find like a phone for like 10 bucks that I could sell for 150 bucks. Mm -hmm. Like those are thick margins, right? I don't care like what level it is. Like you can, if you can find those at scale, like you could buy a hundred of those and you can sell them and you can, mark them up a uh, 16 times. But that's the problem with flipping is that like you can get say a property under contract, you can do three of them at once, but then in order to really get scale, you have to hire a huge ass team, right? Or you have mm -hmm. to like pour a bunch of money into marketing or work with wholesalers or whatever in order to get enough volume. Then the next level up that I see is you've got the um, buying and holding, right? And if you're looking at e-commerce, it's building a brand and then selling repeat products to the same customers. That's buy and hold in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Cause once I get a customer, just like a renter, I'm just paying, like they're paying my bills. I'm just, Hey, we got another product coming out. Hey, we will listen to your problems and your challenges. And by the way, you know, you had back pain. Well, guess what? If you have foot pain, we have this cream or whatever, you know? So you're like, you're, you're cross selling to other products that serve them, but you're getting the same, like you're getting more money from the same customer, right. Versus a one-time yeah. transaction. Well, I was, talking, the, I, the, go ahead. I was just going to say the last level is, um, lending money or financing deals. Okay. Right. So like in e-commerce where I came from, if you want to go over and like finance a product from China, you're going to, if you have money, right, you can go over and put money into a deal and then get a percentage of the profit. So that was like the last level. Same thing with houses. Well, what's interesting, I, inter I interviewed a guy yesterday who, or the other day who has sold, you know, 1500 franchises. He's like the yeah. uh, restaurant King, like five guys, the whole nine. This dude's a monster. And he said, well, people don't understand about business. Let's say websites, let's say Instagram, let's say everything is that a five guys or a Panera bread is not going away from their competition. They're buying the property right next to their competition because they want the cross traffic of said conversation. And so like you're running away because you want to be different when also like those people 
might like your business too. And there's enough business to go around instead of worried about competition. Yeah. And like it's funny cr cross pollinating per se. Yeah, I know. It's funny. I, I, I still, I don't do it anymore. I mean, I still sell some, some crap that we have lying around the house because it's just easy. I just snap a photo. I've got a printer right next to my desk. Now when someone buys something, I slap a label on it and drop it off at the mail. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's just nice. Cause I don't have to deal with, you know, I don't really deal with customer service. Sure. Uh, we don't have customer service. Everything is, if you buy it, there's no returns. Like mm -hmm. I'm not selling crap, so they don't have to return it. But the, where I want to eventually take the online e-commerce space when I have my other businesses running smoothly is I want to sell motorcycle parts because mm -hmm. I ride a motorcycle and I know motorcycles and I can buy motorcycle parts in volume, but it's about differentiating yourself. So anyways, I, I see these, I'm still hanging out in those groups where people are you know, trying to build a side hustle. They're trying to make an extra thousand, 5,000 bucks a month. Yeah. And I just see how uh, competitive some people are. They're like, Hey, I'm trying to figure out how to pull down a list and upload a CSV file to Amazon so I can save myself hours every single week. And people are like, just shooting them down. I'm like, I just direct message them and say, Hey, I don't really sell on Amazon anymore, but here's how you do it. You know, if you ever have any questions, give me a call. You know, by the way, if you are trying to make a, a little bit of money on the side, you know, we do real estate. So if you want to learn more about that, we can hop on a phone call. So I try and like help people, but at the same time, it's my wife saying goodbye. She's going to work. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it's like, it's not a competitive thing, right? Like, like you said, you're a coach. I'm a, a marketer. Like we're not in competition, even though we both like doing short-term rentals, mm -hmm. you know, like we can partner on a deal. Yeah. It's so funny. Like people well, come it, from an adversarial. It's, it's funny. You, uh, you control your, the, the strengths of you in a business setting are aspects of nothing I want to do. So in my mind, as you're saying what you're doing, like I just had a client call me yesterday for a penthouse that we're doing. And I'm thinking to myself, like I might be in Colombia. Like, I don't yeah. like, yeah, I can run it from there. But, but, but in my mind, it's like, should I partner with Cree and take a small percentage of, like, and he gets to do what he loves and he gets to, and, it, and it's run efficiently. And then I'm still servicing my client and I still get access to the property when I need it. And so these are the aspects of business that I have learned to embrace is, is in essence, having a board of directors of the best people in the business. So we can maybe like, perfect example, leaving for Kansas city today, the guys I'm going to be in a business meeting all day tomorrow are masters in civic engineer, civil engineer. Great. Like I, I'm the salesman for the company and an owner. I do not care about yeah. what he's like, well, I don't know if we're going to be able to do the metal frame with, and I was like, Hey, I don't care. Like, and they're like, you don't care. And I'm like, no, I don't care. You're feeling my head with stuff. That doesn't matter. Here's the need. Here's what I know the, the builder and in consumer, the, the investor needs. I can address that when it comes to executing on the bill. I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And I, I was talking with a friend of mine who's a, uh, he, he also coaches on um, kind of entrepreneurs and how to get your shit right in your business. And he was like, what's the highest, the best use of your time. Mm. And it's funny because th this is where I, th I see the value in coaching is that, yeah, you've heard it. You've listened to it on podcasts. You've heard Tony Robbins talk about it. You read it in a book. You've, you probably read it in a book 10 years ago, but you're not doing it. Oops. Sorry. Why are you not doing it? You know, like that concept of, okay, if I make a hundred dollars an hour, and my CEO makes $350 an hour or $400 an hour. Should my CEO do any work that is less than $350 an hour? Mm -mm. Why is he doing it? It's, it's actually robbing the business of money. Mm -hmm. And if I don't take on that work and take that off his plate. He can't go out and make $350 an hour, which means it's costing the business money. So that's how I kind of view it. So, so the one thing... This is the biggest, there's a couple things in life that are kind of like my Loch Ness monster. Like, like I, there's like two things that I believe in the biggest monopolies and gangsters in the, in the United States of America are college bookstores and cell phone companies. <laughs> like I literally bought a book for 180 bucks, used yeah. it for one day, tried to sell it back to them. They said, we'll give you 60 bucks. I was like, oh, this is yeah. just, a it's like used cars. It's like used yeah. cars, man. It's like, yeah. as soon as you grab that book off the lot, it loses half its value. So these are things that I don't understand. Here's the number one thing I do not understand on a business level. The most, if you meet uh, real estate agents, there's an amazing, there's a ton of amazing agents that are sales monsters. I mean, they are 
monsters, right? Like the best people with business, cocktail hour, but yet you ask them to do contracts and you ask them to do transactional work. And I'm like, why don't you have a business where your salesperson is sales facing at all times instead of bogging them down with stuff that doesn't matter? I don't understand that about business. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if that, that's uh, getting more and more into this real estate investing rabbit hole, it's like, uh, being in the beginning, like when you're starting your business, you can run it off your laptop at home and you can go out and, you know, wholesale properties, you need a, a Trek contract and you need to find a deal and mm-hmm. the deal has to make sense to a flipper, not to you. Right. Mm-hmm. I see all these wholesalers that are just like giving a terrible name because all they're trying to do is just get lock properties under contract mm-hmm. and they're screwing the whole industry. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because people think like, oh, you're just a, you like, I only want cash buyers. You hear cash buyer, cash buyer. It's like, what, what does it matter if I'm using my cash or their cash? <laughs> exactly. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but people are trying to weed out the wholesalers because so many wholesalers are unprofessional, you know? Yeah. But well, the, yeah, they're unprofessional, but more importantly, they, they don't understand how to present a property to an investor to give them, like, everybody's busy. You're busy. I'm busy. If I gave you a property to, like, perfect example, we just sent the earnest money like 30 minutes ago for a property we're buying. It's my first flip in a while that has nine lots we're going to build on. Mm -hmm. The guy that sold it to me is a builder himself. He called the city and got all the answers I already needed. I didn't have to do any work myself. He got the answers. And I thought to myself, what a seamless project. Like, I know how much he's making. He knows how much I'm going to make on the end. Everybody's okay with it. (laughs) Nobody cares. And it's just because when someone's educated and they understand how the process works, that as the wholesaler, you can't be asking for more meat on the bone than the flipper. Mm-hmm. Like you're not taking any risk. You're, you're putting your name on a piece of paper and you're selling the paper to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Like why would you earn $50,000 when the flipper's making 50? Mm-hmm. So like that to me just makes no sense at all. And there's, there's one of two categories of people. There's ignorance or idiots. Mm-hmm. Ignorance is you lack the knowledge. Idiots are people that are just being greedy. They know. Mm-hmm that this is how it's supposed to work. Like if you've got a property that's worth say 200,000 and you're going to get it a hundred thousand and you're going to assign it for say a $5,000 fee or a $10,000 fee, and the flipper's going to have to put in 20 or 30,000, they're going to make $40,000 profit. That's fair. Mm-hmm. But they're trying to like squeeze out $60,000 profit. And it's like, what are you doing? You don't want to be in business, do you? No, you know? so- because what I see, and I think what you've seen, because you deal with a lot of people building their websites, is so many people are worried about the dollar, this little dollar, or trying to squeeze the most out of somebody instead of taking a reputation in business of, look, I'll give you a prime example. I'm not saying this to 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 stroke my ego by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying this is the I'll way that, away. No, this is the way that my mindset works. So long story yeah. short, I got a referral from a buddy. I don't, I don't do business in Houston. Like I, I don't like, I, like I grew up there, but I don't do a lot of real estate there. Well, this is North it's on the lake. So the, the inspector's great. They're good inspectors. I know they are. Mm-hmm. Well, this is about an hour out of their way. Like this is, this is, she goes, well, we'll do it anyway. Like, cause we know this guy and we want to serve you. Right. And I need questions okay. from them. Cause I've never, I've never built before. I need like real questions from an inspector. So we got done. She gave me the price and I said, why don't you add $50 onto it for, for going out of your way? And she goes, what just happened? She goes in 20, <laughs> she goes in 20 years of doing business. Nobody's ever added money onto the deal. Yeah. But there's like four of us splitting it. I said, well, it's like 20 bucks a piece. Like who cares? And like, she's like, Oh my God, this is so great because now I have an ally going into the, to the, to the business deal. Who's in a good mood to do business with me. I don't know where that relationship go. It might be the only time we talk. But at least I created an ally instead of creating an enemy, an enemy by trying to squeeze the most out of them. A couple bucks that at the end of the day doesn't matter in the big scope of the project. Yeah, hundred percent, man. And the same thing with like, you know, with running a short term rental business or you know even a rental property business. Mm-hmm. It's like, have you ever seen that movie with Chevy Chase, the Christmas family vacation thing, where he like blows yeah. the tree up and you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, where like the the sewer line creates a rocket ship out of the yeah. Santa Claus. So like at the end of that movie, the the moral of the story is like the rich guy gets kidnapped and brought to his house, and he's like, "Why did you take away the bonuses? We were counting on those bonuses." And then he's like, "I don't know. It just kind of made sense on the bottom line." And it's like, it, so many people operate their business like it makes sense on the bottom line. It's like, I don't really need to make 
that extra one half of a percent or one percent if it means that my people aren't taken care of mm. you know mm -hmm. like we've got a team we've got a team of people that we form a relationship with and like i'm trusting them to go in there and do a good job to to clean the place you know <laughs> actually to actually yeah. clean the place and i'm looking at certain metrics like what are the guests saying about the place because mm -hmm. if they start saying, oh, the place is kind of dirty or they didn't give us a great review about how clean it was, that means that there's something wrong. It could be that that person is feeling unfulfilled. It could be that feel that that person feels like they are not being taken care of financially. It could be that they are just, they had a bad day, but I'm going to have a conversation with them about it. And the other thing to that point was, um, I wanted to, at Christmas time, I wanted to give them a bonus, you know, nothing crazy, like hundred bucks, you know? Like we're, it, we're not going to become millionaires with a hundred bucks, but at the same time, it's like that little extra gesture mm -hmm. of, Hey, let me give, like, give you something because I know that I'm coming from a market where we have a lot more going on and that's a much smaller market and it might just help. It might just help mm -hmm. them like make their rent the next month. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, I'm not saying like, just give people stuff for free. This individual works her butt off for it. Mm -hmm. She does, she does like, she works seven days a week sometimes. Mm -hmm. So like I'm, I'm about, I had a conversation with her about it. I was like, Hey, um, have you ever considered buying properties or yeah. owning the property? Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I know that it's not just about giving them money. It's also about sharing the knowledge and mm -hmm. bringing people with you. And, and the other thing is like, if she goes out and she's like, Hey, Hey Cree, um, I saw this property that looks like it's not being rented right now. Exactly. Maybe you should talk to the owner. And I'm like, huh? Yeah. Give me their number. And then I go over and give them a call. Hey, my cleaner was telling me that, uh, you, you might have a property that's available. I'm interested in renting in your area. And then boom, we get another deal. She gets more business. Dude, dude, we, we got, when, when I was running the big company, I can't tell you how many deals we got from our cleaners. Like how many contracts we got from our cleaners? Like how many contracts, how many houses I, pot, I potentially got from roofers? Like guys, yeah. the, the the traditional people, the, the the people that you don't think of or the people that are actually talking to the owners and actually know what the deals are. You need to keep your ears open and treat the people right. And you have no idea who might bring you the next deal. What I want to do to get the most value because you're so smart in a couple different areas. I, first, I want to talk about Anybody that's an entrepreneur or runs a business, what aspects, I know you could go off in nine different directions, so I'll try to give you the most concise answer I could. When it comes to a website, when it comes mm -hmm. to anything that they're doing, branding-wise or just in, in general, when somebody's starting out, what's the top one or two three things that they need to be focused on? Should they just be focused on maybe just an Instagram, just a YouTube page? Should they be in seven different page, you know, seven different platforms? What are you, what's your advice to entrepreneurs? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say, you know, there's, there's so many different facets of marketing when it comes to even just the digital aspect of it. You know, you've got two major categories, branding and marketing. Branding is, you know, you're Austin Lenny, you're this loud, crazy, funny, ginger red, like fireball. You know, you walk into a room and people know you, right? That's your brand. Mm -hmm. Marketing is getting people to come up to you and say, Hey, tell me more about what you do. So marketing mm -hmm. is what we're doing on your website. Your brand is the construct your life podcast, mm -hmm. right? And so the core elements of marketing are your message, your media, and your, or excuse me, your message, your market, and your medium. Mm -hmm. Your message is what you say to people. So I help entrepreneurs who are stuck in a rut, get over that, right? I help entrepreneurs who are feeling unfulfilled, et cetera get said result. The media is how you get the message out. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, email, text, going on television shows, whatever. That's a media. That's a method of communication, right? Shouting on the corner is a media, right? You could just stand on the corner, jumping up and down. Hey, I'm Austin Lenny. I coach entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Like that could be a medium. And then the uh, market is who you're talking to. So if you're like, I help entrepreneurs who are struggling with overwork, addiction, being stuck in their, their business, get over that. I help them get the right mindset so that they can thrive. Then that is who you're working with. If I'm talking about nurses, I help nurses create passive income through investing in real estate. I help, you know, cleaners structure their business properly so that they can save more on taxes and start passively investing in real estate. So the, who you help is important too. 
So more so than getting a fancy website up or putting together your Instagram, you have to th- step back for a second and think, who do I want to serve and where are they? Because if I jump on Instagram and I'm trying to serve boomers, do boomers have Instagram? I don't, I don't know, right? Who is on Instagram? And if I'm out on TikTok and I'm trying to serve, you know, military advisors, they're probably not on TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. And if I'm like trying to send email or direct mail to a list of millennials or zennials, they probably don't even open it. So it's, it's, you've got to really understand. And this is something I struggled with in the beginning was I was helping lawyers and doctors and dentists and real estate agents and real estate investors and, and restaurants and I was too broad and I had no, no, uh, focus. Right. Mm -hmm. So my number one piece of advice is think about who you want to serve and have a conversation with them and ask them, what can I help you with? Mm. And then once you get that conversation going and they're like, Hey, I have no idea. Maybe it's an attorney. And he's like, how the hell does this TikTok thing work? And you're having fun on TikTok, and you got a thousand, 2000 subscribers. And you're like, Oh, I can help you with that. And then you just go help them with it. And they're like, oh my God, you're so good at this. I suck at this. And you're like, yeah, it's fun. Like I enjoy it. Well, then you become the TikTok guy for attorneys, you know, mm-hmm. or you become like the LinkedIn guru for uh, apartment syndicators, but you, you take a strength that you have mind systems and you plug that into what market needs it. And the other piece of advice I would say is pick a skill that's going to pay you what you want to get paid. So for example, copywriting, if you're good at writing copy that sells, some copywriters charge tens of thousands of dollars. I have a friend that does email copywriting. Yes. Email. I said email, email copywriting that produces hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit. And he charges tens of thousands of dollars for it. And that's because he's crafted that skill. He started in web design too, but email is just one of those unique mediums where if someone is interested in reading your emails. You know, those email open rates are bogged down by all the guys that send out bulk junk mail. Mm -hmm. So the open rates are like 20%. Oh, 20%. It's so bad, right? I want to get the most open rate percentage. What you want to do is you want to get the most conversations going and people realizing your value. Joseph calls it instilling beliefs. So you want to be able to instill your beliefs in people, like taking care of people, doing business the right way. If you do business the way that takes care of people, profits will follow. And that'll start attracting and training people how you work in business. So what media you use isn't as important as who you want to attract and the words that you use to attract them. Does that make sense? It makes, dude, you just fucking destroyed the last couple of minutes. Uh, That was one one last thing. One last thing I want to give you. No, we're not, we're not, we're not ending. You're crushing it. Yeah. (laughs) Well, one, one last thing. Cause this, um, well, one last thing I want to talk about on this point is, uh, in terms of, of SEO, cause that's what I focused on in the beginning was just like, I'm SEO, 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 SEO is just one facet. So you're trying to appease the search engines. You're trying to appease Google and Pinterest and Facebook and Twitter and every single software is a search engine. So you're trying to make them happy, right? But you're also trying to make it interesting for people to read or watch or to learn or to stay engaged. And you're trying to provide them value for what they're searching for. So it it is quite literally search engine optimization. One component of it is having links back to your site. So if you are going to build a website, if you are that process, you know who you want to serve, then you build a website, then you have to go over and get links. Links are just basically votes. Mm -hmm. So you get Twitter, you get Pinterest, you get LinkedIn, you get Instagram, you claim all those profiles. If you're going to build a personal brand, say Austin Linney, Go get Austin Linney on all those channels and then just point them back to your website. And then they could just sit there. It could just be, Hey, I'm Austin Linney. I help entrepreneurs do X, Y, Z. And then it just points back to your site. But what will happen is if you start using that medium, that traffic goes back to your site. So that's like search engine optimization. Number one, number two is put valuable content out there. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to post an article about, uh, how to start a small business and that's in your tagline you write an article about how to start small business. It has to be valuable, not just content. Well, it's interesting. You made me think about something. I think a lot of times when we're producing content or, or documenting content, we're, we're, we're placing a video or placing something up there. 
instead of reaching out and engaging our audience in a conversation in mm-hmm. the comments, meaning like leave them open-ended. Like that's what good copyright does. Leave it open-ended to engage the group in a conversation that takes off in your comments that projects the algorithm to shoot you up. So you kind of almost got to play the game of what are your thoughts on this? Do you have some feedback? Like, instead of just like, here's my thing. Yeah. And and well, it's, and it's, it's way more complicated than that because Mm -hmm. Google has 200 ranking factors. Mm -hmm. So like we wouldn't even be able to start to scratch the surface in this, this conversation just because there are so many different things that Google looks at in order to help rank different websites, basically web properties, businesses. So you've got also two core facets of search. You've got local search, which is, you know, Joe's cleaners and Papa John's and now pizza near me and hairstylist near me or lawyer near me. And then you've got online businesses, which are just national or international, right? So you've got a blog about personal finance. You've got a blog about, uh, decorations and, uh, you know, whatever, like fixing a, a car, right? And that might now play into your YouTube channel, which is basically a blog. It's a syndication, a feed of content. But the core f- component of search is people are looking for a specific phrase. That phrase has a s- certain type of intent, like mindset coaching for entrepreneurs. I need help with mindset coaching. Or how do you get your mindset right? Or how do you fix a broken mindset? Or what is a life coach? How does a life coach help? What does a life coach do? Uh, how much does a life coach get paid? What does a life coach cost? What kind of value does a life coach bring? How does a life coach work? Those are phrases that people are searching with the intent of learning about a life coach in order to go out there and actually hire a life coach. So those are people that are looking to hire your type of business. And you may call it mindset coaching. You may call it entrepreneur coaching. You may call it you know experiential learning coaching, whatever. But what they're using to search for you and the questions they're asking is all public information. You can go to Google and search, you know, how do you change a tire? And then Google will show you all these other questions. And you click, you click on one and it just shows you five more. So it's like, that's a great way of doing research to figure out what does your customer want? And then you go ahead and answer those questions. You post a video, you write an article answering those questions. And then that content gets picked up by Google and Google's like, oh, this person's searching for what's a life coach do. This guy wrote an article about what's a life coach do. And then they connect you. Mm-hmm. So that's search engine optimization. And then you also have search marketing. Well, search marketing is kind of a broad topic, but you've got search uh, paid search mar- marketing. Mm-hmm. Same concept. You take the keyword, but rather than write a long ass article, you just buy the word. Mm-hmm. And then you funnel them to a landing page that has usually a lot less content. No, I love this. And I want to make sure um, we're kind of jumping around here, but I want to make sure that they get a, they get a view into your, how your mind works. Cause I think a lot of people will get this. I'm going to drop a broad question in there and then you can go where you want to. I'm interested to hear, even though we've had some conversations, your view on let's say Airbnb investing, like, you know, there's a million different ways to invest out there. I know you do it a couple different ways and a couple different avenues, but I know that's something that you you seem to have jumped onto and, and, and enjoy. Kind of walk us through your thoughts on Airbnb and, and why you are enjoying this model. Because I know you just got back from Florida doing one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny you asked that because I actually, while we were there, uh, our neighbor actually asked us if we wanted to buy our house. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll buy your house. Probably not for the price you want, but I would buy your house, <laughs> you know, cause I, I just, I follow markets in general. So, uh, e-commerce, um, the stock market, I also do a little bit of day trading and I, I do want to get more into options trading. Cause I think that there's less risk for options trading than just dumping money into a stock and trying to pull it out. Um, but as far as the Airbnb question goes, I mean, I, I like short-term rentals. And a short-term rental for me is anything less than 12 months. So it could be a three-month stay, a six-month stay. Um, nightly rental is you know one to three nights typically. Uh, but the thing I, I relate this to people is imagine you're going to Costco and you buy a case of 48 Coca-Colas and the Cokes cost you, say, 10 bucks 
right? Just to make the math easy. You pay 10 bucks for a case of 48 Cokes. Well, what happens if you go over to your kid's soccer game and you stand out there and you say, Cokes for a dollar fifty, Cokes for a dollar fifty. And people, it sells out, right? Because they don't want to go take a trip over to the convenience store or to Costco and buy a case of Cokes and drink 48 Cokes. So they're paying for the convenience. So if they spend, like it costs you 48 cents a Coke. If they spend a buck fifty, it's not like it's not too much out of their pocket, right? They don't care. But they got that convenience of that refreshing Coke. Well, you just made three times on your money. And so that's what we're doing with short-term rentals is we're taking a 12 month rental and we're breaking it down into a month or a week or a night. And people are willing to pay a premium for that. And we're doing volume. So we're able to get that two, three times what normal rents would cost. Right. And that's where we make our, our money is that we have a spread. And so that spreads different for every city. It's different for every neighborhood. It's dependent on a lot of different factors. Like we look for things that are not seasonal, right? So like if you go to um, New York state and you're trying to be next to a baseball stadium, I mean, I, I guess they play baseball year round, but it's also snowing half the time versus down here in Texas, you go over and you put yourself right next to a hospital. Are people going to stop getting sick? Probably not. Right. That's why if you look where the hotels are, the hotels are in certain spots around the city. Why? Like you talked about, it's like when you're a franchise owner, you look for all the franchises. You look for all the restaurants that are franchises because that's where your customer is. It's the same thing with what we're doing. We're looking for short-term rental opportunities. When I look for a property, I'm like, okay, is there a school? Uh, excuse me. Is there a, a university, a hospital, or a, um, a military base? And those three things are that, that rental in Florida, there's three of those right next to us, like mm -hmm. 10 minutes away. There's an airport, 15 minutes away. There's a hospital, five minutes away. There's a beach, 10 minutes away. There's a military base, 15 minutes away. And the funny thing is that military base, our house is between the military base and downtown. So it's like, it's like this trifecta. And I'm like, wow, this is great. You know, like whether we're renting to medical travelers, we're renting to families visiting their military folk, or we're renting to families that are sending their kids off to college, or we're renting to vacation families. We always have business. So like, that's what I look for when I'm investing in these short-term properties, because even if worst case scenario, we can't run it as an Airbnb, right? We can still convert it into a long-term rental because there's demand for rentals. So it just, for me, it's like, I guess what I'm looking for is I'm looking for opportunities where, um, there's arbitrage opportunities, or I'm looking for opportunities where there's an underserved market, right? Cause there's, there's in Austin, which is where we live. Uh, there are more and more hotels being built every single year and they're not slowing down even cause of COVID. And on top of that, there's less and less available space. But I just called an apartment complex and they've got 15 units available. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hmm, the hotels are building and the apartments are empty. Hmm. You know, so, and, and for me, all I come out of pocket is I go pay the lease and I basically operate the property and I furnish it versus having to come out of pocket 50, 60, $100,000 for a house. So I can put down $20,000 to set up a, a cash flowing property and I can usually make my money back in the first year. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's the funny thing is, is that like the more I get down to this rabbit hole, I'm like, oh man, I don't really want to do marketing anymore. This is so much fun, you know, but then I'm like, oh, but if I just reposition my business a little bit, I can still serve people, but I want to do it more in a systematic way so that we can serve at scale. But then I can also have time to go over here and set up these little, you know, cash machines <laughs> basically. <laughs> A couple things. I don't think I've heard anybody break down Airbnb better than you just did. So I hope everybody rewinds that. Second thing is I, I read a book um, called Build to Sell. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, a book about a dude, a fictional dude that owns a marketing agency. And uh, yeah. he said, I want to sell my business. And the, and the guy said, how much is my business worth? And he said, nothing. And he was like, what are you talking Like, I've been building my business for 10 years. Yeah, but you're all over the place. You don't have systems. You don't have one thing that you're good at. And so yep. they re they repositioned the company to just do logos. Like, that's mm -hmm. all they did. And they could sell that process over and over again. It didn't take the owner to do it. And so ever since I heard and listened to that book, 
there's a couple of things that have happened to me in the last couple of months. I've been studying a lot about behavioral investing and, and kind of how they do it in the stock market. And one of the things he keeps harping against is like, you're not fucking special. Like mm-hmm. you're not special, your product special, highlight the product, highlight the system, let the system do its work. And then you can go live your life. And yep. so as we build up this new business, like the aspects of what we do for the investor and the construction space and the speed that we can do it at is the amazing thing. It's not the Austin Linney show. That's the amazing thing. It's this product that we've created because when I create the product and highlight the product, then I can go bring in Austin Linney 2.0, you know, that I've trained and cultivated so I can go disappear to Spain and let this guy make money in your twenties. Your ego doesn't allow you to do that. But as I creep up here on 40, I just want to do stuff with fun people, but also that maybe it takes up three days out of my week, not seven. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel the same exact way, man. It's like I started uh, the hustling when I was 21, when I got out of college and didn't really learn that lesson until about 28 Mm -hmm. when I was like, wow, I don't really like grinding all the time. Mm You know, mm-hmm. and like to what your to your point, I look at this and I'm like, holy crap! Because what we're doing is when when I go in and let's say I I work with apartment owner, I had a networking event I went to about a year ago, and an apartment owner approached me and said, "Could you do this with like a whole building?" And I was like, "Ha ah, ah, ha ah, ha! No, <laughs> I can't even really do this with a few properties." And he was like. No, I mean, what would it take? And then he gave me this idea of, you know, what about the the uh, medical centers? What about the Indian mm-hmm. community that comes and mm-hmm. works for Dell? I'm like, yeah, 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 no, no, our thing's working. And I look back on, it, I'm like, wow, crap, he was really right. And now I'm actually doing exactly that. But more to the point of when, let's say we look at like a two bedroom, one bath apartment. That two bedroom, one bath apartment will probably net twenty seven hundred dollars a year. Mm-hmm. That cash flow can be sold to someone that wants to invest in that. So like to get net $2,700 a year, most people would have to buy a 500 or $600,000 house. And then they're maybe lucky if they can clear that in net cash flow, but they're also banking on appreciation. Mm-hmm. So someone can come in and pay $54,000, $75,000 for that cash flow and get cash flow immediately. So like that's to me, that was like, holy crap, we're selling cash flow. We're selling... I, I, I had a friend close yesterday in Cleveland on two old, like, so it's three different buildings, 12 units or 14 units, all needs a full gut remodel, like 1850s, like beautiful, beautiful buildings, like old architecture, but they're going to turn the whole thing into, cause it's right next to one of the number one hospitals in the state. They're going to turn it into, yeah, they're going to turn it into short-term rentals for nurses and doctors on three month, two month stays. And mm-hmm. I thought to myself, like, they're going to take their $100 a door or $200 a door and they're going to take it to a thousand. And the yeah, multiplier, dude. the multiplier on that is going to be insane. Yeah. 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 Cause it's, it's all about the cash flow when you look at multifamily. And I started looking at these luxury experiential stays. Like I've got a partner in um, actually in Chicago who he's done this with three properties, but he takes million dollar properties that are sitting on the market for a year, two years. He approaches the owner and does a lease option with them and converts them into cash flow. And like the cash flow he's making on one property, I'm like, I would take like 17 of my properties to do that. Like 10, 10 of them, you know? There's it. There's it. Yeah. But you know, I also looked at that, this uh, 28 unit. I'm like, well, if I just grab 10 of those units at once, it's the same thing. You know, it's just, you there's, know, a, there's, you, there's a guy named Bill. I'll introduce you. He's actually going to be in Nashville. He's built a mo- couple multi multiple businesses. He is the king of like on Clubhouse. Everybody's talking about Airbnb. They have like 130 properties, 140. He's like, you're dumb. He'll just tell them straight to their face. He's like, all I do is travel. Wait, he specializes yeah. in the luxury market. Yeah. He has eight properties, eight properties. That's it. Around the world, around the United States that brought in $600,000 last year. Because they're all 20. in- they're all, they're, yeah, they're all in the, well, I think that was net. They're all in the, yeah. they're all in the, the three to a hundred, a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a night. He says, your customer base is better. He mm-hmm. said, it's, I'm creating this experience. And then he's like, then I get to access to those properties. And so it's the same reason why we switched our model with the type of clients that we're servicing the management spaces. 
yeah, I would like, I would rather do that because now we're looking at a net profit of a thousand to 3000 bucks a month instead of five to 400 bucks a month and having to do multiple properties. You know, I've got a client who is closing on five lots on a lake. And he's like, how about we just do all eight houses? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds great in one area. Then yeah. we can scale up the cleaner, the supplies, so many things on a, on a different level. Yeah, dude. And you can even, I mean, I just talked to a short-term rental management company in town and all they do is downtown Terrytown and East Austin. Cause it's like, for them, it's like, they've got their entire client base and that, that one little quarter mile, you know, half, half square mile, may, maybe mm -hmm. uh, stretch of land. And uh, we had a, my wife worked for a family that she's, she's kind of like a luxury nanny, um, which is a new term. We're going to actually create a new category for that. But she, she works with um, families that are very affluent. And the last family she worked with, they had a house that was right in Terrytown. It was a, I want to say it was like on a quarter acre, probably lot. It was a corner lot. So it was like the biggest house on the street. And uh, they rented it out for 5,000 a night and they got three nights minimum. So like each month they moved out of their house for three nights and stayed at another Airbnb <laughs> and they're arbitraging their house. And they specifically bought it for that reason. Cause mm -hmm. the, the guy that uh, him and his wife are, he's a business owner. Um, she's a stay at home mom. She used to work at a nonprofit, but um, she, they decided that they wanted to buy this property because he's like, I, I just like the cash flow. You know, mm. he had four, four franchises and didn't really need the money, but why so, not? You know, so you're going to love this. I have a friend. I was just in Arizona. I have a friend. His name will be nameless. He told me about what they're doing. So they're amazing at wholesaling and flipping like really good, mm -hmm. like really good. The profit margins are huge uh, and they, and they don't spend a lot on overhead. Well, he has got so good because he's lived in his business for an entire year, not outsourced it. They've done a million dollars in a year like $90,000, you know, profit cuts. And he has trained and systematized these cold callers and they liked it. They like him. Uh -huh. And so he's like, well, fuck. So he has access to the cold car. So what he's doing is they're buying the cold callers at a price per hour. And then they're mm -hmm. selling the cold calling services to other investors at a 50% oh, at a 50 markup. And they're not doing yeah. anything. That's it's arbitrage. It's like, yes. that's there, arbitrage is everywhere. I, I first learned about it when I was selling crap on eBay. It's like, I so how would you, sale. how would you in a, in a, in a cre deep analytical definition, explain to me what arbitrage means in just general sense. How much is this teacup worth? Mm -hmm. uh, probably like three fifty. I don't know. Okay. If I go over and I take it over to John Leno's house and John Leno, has it for a minute. He signs it and I bring it back. How much is it worth now? Probably like 200 bucks. Right. What did I do? All I did was I moved it, right? Mm -hmm. I moved it over. I got somebody to sign it. He has some sort of intrinsic value. Another example would be, okay, I've got water in a desert, right? If I take water over to a stream, how much are they willing to pay for it? Mm -hmm. And the stream is free. You know, why would I pay for water if the stream's free? Bring it over to a desert. They'll pay whatever, because if it's your last drop of water, you need water more than you need money. So arbitrage is about finding demand and going to a place that has low demand and bringing items or products to a place that has high demand. Essentially. No, I, I love it. And, and, and so one of the aspects for me is I look at my brand. We just had a conversation this morning because I'm me. So I this morning, I've already talked to somebody in London and Spain. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring my brand and my podcast and my coaching to Europe. Yeah. Because there's a large pond, you know, over the pond, whatever there's in South America. So like we're looking at Airbnbs in Colombia right now because mm -hmm. the price, the need for Airbnbs and the cost to get in Airbnbs are very, the, and the, and the, the price to maintenance are very low too. So we have yeah. this, this great system, right? And so why everybody's trying to do the same thing as everybody else, I'm trying to cast a bigger net with a different type of audience, right? And, and so that's the way I've always looked at my business is how do we take this thing? Because I think that the bigger issue is, is that people are so concerned about, and I'll just use it context as a, or content as an, exp, an explanation. Well, I know, but I don't want to do a podcast because there's too many people do podcasts. 
It's like, yeah, but your podcast is not for everybody else. And if you have a concentrated audience of 100 people mm-hmm. opposed to uh, 10,000 people listening to you and not doing anything, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's the same conversation around email. It's like, I don't want to do email because everybody else is doing email. Like, oh, so you're telling me you don't want to make money? Like, you're telling me that you don't want to grow your business? Like, oh, I don't want to be on social media because everybody's on social media. Okay, well, if everybody was, uh, let's say, not going to college, would you go to college just because everybody wasn't doing it? Like, no, it's got to be what's right for your business. And I think that goes back to the um, being specific with your target audience. Because when I started, it was just like, I help everybody. And that's the problem is like, and I noticed that with your podcast, you were totally opposite. You mm-hmm. construct your life. It's a real estate podcast. It's about helping entrepreneurs, not everybody, entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. mindset, interviewing experts, real estate. It's all about real estate because mm-hmm. that's what you have an experience in. Mm-hmm. And that attracted more real estate people. And now mm-hmm. you're starting to kind of branch out into other niches, but it started with, with this niche, right? And so I think that's for... if. I wanted to just throw this out there because if I could talk to myself 10 years ago, I'd say, look, just focus on one, one vertical, go talk to dentists or go talk to lawyers or go get a job at a marketing agency and figure out which guys you don't like and which guys you do like, and then just work with the ones you like, right? If lawyers are jerks, then don't work with them, you know? And, and it's, it's funny. Cause like, I think that would be my number one advice is just go get a job, go get a job in an industry that you want to be in. And learn the trade and just suck it up for a couple of years. Make nothing, make no money at all. Make $25,000 a year, but learn how to be a, a pro at something like find out whatever it is that you like to do and then get clients on the side yeah. and then just get more clients and more clients until at some point it makes no sense where you're making three times with your clients on the side as you are at your job and you've done it for three months. You got all this money in the bank and you're like, well, I'm making my clients money. My clients are paying me. My clients like me. Uh, peace. And then you just go over here and just work with your clients. You know, I think that's what nobody, everybody hears that, but nobody wants to do it because they're like, oh, can I go to my job? Oh, my job. Well, you know? in, a, in a mindset shift, we were just talking about this on Monday and, and I, apparently I'm on like three, po- I have three podcasts right now. I don't even know what's going on, but we were talking about the mindset shit as simple as this, right? I have to go to my job instead of I get to. Yeah. I get to be or, on this episode with Cree right now. We get to talk about this amazing conversation. I get to drive to Kansas City tonight to go see my business partners instead of I have to. Because here's the big kicker. Aubrey Marcus said this with Ed Milet. You could not drink water and you would die. You could not eat and you would die. But ultimately, it's still a choice. And a lot of times in life, we get down the road and we think that we have to. I have to be on this call. I have to do this. You don't have to do anything. You you don't even have to get out of bed. (laughs) Like the the guys that don't get out of bed, though, they're the 800 pound guys that get, you know, scooped off their bed and, and they just like, they don't get to live. You know, you don't get to live life if you're not willing to go out and do anything. And I just had this conversation with my wife this morning. She's like, she's distraught. And, And this is a little context. So again, luxury nanny, right? Mm-hmm. I'm like, babe, you could rather than be being a personal trainer or trying to start, you know, an interior design business or like any of this other crap that you want to do. Cause she, she's getting the entrepreneurial bug. It's rubbing off on her. I'm like, Hey, listen, you're a nanny, right? You're an expert. You spent 20 years being with children, developing children. You have a degree in childhood education and you could go over here and try and be a personal trainer but you don't have any experience doing that. So why not build a business around teaching nannies to be more, to be able to negotiate better with parents? Yes. Dude, this is so real quick. Yeah. She just made, she made five G's in 10 days. Yes. Because of how she positioned herself and because she's not willing to work for less. And also because she had a conversation, she was able to effectively present her services to the family and they could afford her. That was the thing. It's like, stop trying to sell to broke people. Well, this is, yeah, no, this, that's first of all, amazing for your wife, but super important. I learned this from a venture capitalist guy, but when you're in the fray, like, okay, I'll I'll use a perfect example. 
let's say that you coach quarterbacks, right? Like I only use my, my friend's kid for an example. Like, let's say he, he's a good quarterback and you, and you, and you can coach people one-on-one, but what if instead you, you drew back and what if you taught, you know, schools, how to coach people that do quarterback, like, right. Like what's the scale that allows you to remove yourself from it and allow you, like you said, to sell to a higher audience you know, and, and then like always think a little bit bigger and then figure out how you can wrap that around instead of this is the only thing I do. And I just think a lot of people are looking at things from a small lens instead of understanding the larger mechanism and more importantly, valuing yourself. Like your, your wife decided that this is my value. And yes, it might be hard because I'm going to turn away business, but I'm ultimately going to get what I need. But more importantly, it's not going to take anything it's not going to take any more time of my lifestyle than I'm ready to give. Yeah, that was it. We made the decision whenever I was like, hey, I want to go full time in my businesses. And she was like, okay. Um, so it was a little bit of a, a, a pushing back and forth because when we started out a relationship, we wanted to be completely separate in finances. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of realized like, well, what happens if she loses her job? I'm, I'm just going to like leave her there and like not take care of her. Mm-hmm. And then I was also like, well, what happens if I lose my income? Is she just going to like, let me starve? Probably not. Right. So we just decided to join forces and we're like, you know what? We're not going to worry about the downside. We're just going to focus on growing and investing together and everything I learned, she benefits from and vice versa. At any time that like, let's say I have a really shitty month and I just don't really make as much money as I thought. Well, my wife is still earning her job, her income, and that supports us together. And we're able to go over and invest in things faster. And the more that we team up with other people, the faster that we can acquire cash flow or assets. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk about too the the leverage and scale of being like selling your time. Mm-hmm. Like one of the reasons why I was not excited about selling my time in helping you build a website is because it's still selling my time. Mm-hmm. And I can only sell it to so many people at once. Mm-hmm. And I'm not willing to work 80 hour work weeks anymore. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with my wife is like she can sell her time at $30 an hour. The only way that she can make more money is by working more working more hours. She's not willing to do because she cares about her health and her sanity. I don't know if you've had kids before, but kids are, (laughs) yeah. Plus you got to deal with the parents. Um, or she can sell her time for more, right? Which is what she's steadily done over time is she's increased her, her dollar per hour rate, but to really get more scale, she can do one of two things. She can start an info business in this niche, teaching nannies how to be you know, better negotiators, how to get more paid time off, how to make an extra 10 grand a year, sell it to them for 50 to hundred bucks, or she can start an agency, mm-hmm. which is like what you're talking about with the cold callers, find somebody that's willing to work for 15 bucks an hour, negotiate better pay and benefits with the family, take a $5 spread, charge them 20, give them 15. Every single person that's working, she's getting a certain dollar per hour spread and she has to handle the legal paperwork. Mm-hmm. So then she becomes an agency owner, which is like fine, but you got to understand like she doesn't have like a lot of business acumen, nothing against her, but she'd have to go out there and market herself. She'd have to get her clients. She'd have to do sales, which she's scared of. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, you're not, you shouldn't be scared of sales. You already sell yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't have jobs without it, you know, but all that extra stuff, it's like, she doesn't want to be there right now. She just wants to have a job. So I, I think people, um, need to think about that before they just jump into something, you know, thousand percent. Dude, I, I think this might be the longest podcast I've ever done and we could still go for a long time. No, I'm, I'm serious. Like is that I, a good I'm, thing or bad thing. It's a great thing. I can, this conversation is amazing. Dude, there's okay. so much, so many different avenues. You just destroyed this podcast. So if people want to find out more about what you do, there's such dude, he's guys, he's like nine more layers deep on financing and so many things. Uh, how would they find out about you? How would they get, uh, find out what you got going on? Yeah. So if they want help with marketing, uh, it's intelligence marketing. That's G E N T S. Uh, it's kind of like a play on gentlemen. So gentlemen in marketing, um, they can go over to that website. You can find me on social media anywhere at Cree C R I dot childs or Cree childs. One of those two, I try to claim all the profiles I could. Um, I've also got a YouTube channel that somewhere in the, uh, spider web of my links, you can get to my YouTube channel. 
and I teach people about business finance, starting a small business. Um, I, I really, I, I try to help entrepreneurs that are just starting out people that are just trying to get off the ground because I remember what it was like to just be completely lost when I was starting to start my first business. So that's what some of my context content is focused on. Um, when it comes to the real estate stuff, uh, pretty much all of it can be found at millennial investing And that's, um, I put together a Facebook group where I just share, you know, information about investing, real estate, what I'm doing with the stock market, uh, different people that I know, kind of building a network and connections uh, with the goal of being able to foster relationships, conversations, partnerships, um, learning. You know, that's just that ecosystem is what I'm I'm building. So if they want to learn about real estate, go there. Um, or just shoot me an email, you know, millennial R E I group at gmail.com. So I know that was like six things, but again, we caught, we caught about marketing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We caught him on one of those things. Guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends and we'll see you next time, guys. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.